Lisa Tadeo is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Three Women. She has contributed to the New York Times, Esquire, and many other publications. Her nonfiction has been included in the anthologies, Best American Political Writing and Best American Sports Writing, and her short stories have won two pushcart prizes. Tonight, she will be in conversation with Claire Dieterer. Claire is the author of two critically acclaimed memoirs, Love and Trouble, A Midlife Reckoning, and Poser, My Life in 23 Yoga Poses, which was also a New York Times bestseller. She's a book critic, an essayist, a reporter, and a long and a, a longtime contributor to the New York Times, and has also written for the Atlantic, Vogue, and New York Magazine, among, among other publications. We would also like you to purchase Claire's book if you'd be so inclined. We will have a link in the chat box for her both her titles as well. So without further ado, I'm going to leave it to Claire and Lisa to chat. We'll come back and talk about um, bringing uh, audience questions probably at about quarter of eight. So without further ado, here we go. Thank you so much, Patty. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Patty. Um, I'll get things rolling since I'm the interlocutor for this amazing <laughs> book. Um, I'm going to start just by going back in time a little bit and to July 6th, 2019. I'm, I just, as I was we were waiting to start the reading, I went back and looked at my Instagram post for three women. Um, because I remember picking up the book and it nobody knew anything about it. Lisa was a debut author and I had just posted something about it and described it as a glorious, delicious beast of a book. And then I was lucky enough to get to talk with Lisa about three women, I think the week it published. Mm -hmm. And um, I could, feel, I don't want to like have this be all about my own purse capacity or whatever, whatever <laughs> word I'm trying to use there, but you know, I could feel something was about to happen and um, it was really a thrill to get to talk to you, but then to see the way that the book was picked up and the way people responded to it, which I, I thought they would. The book was, you know, written on all themes that, that are of primal interest to me about femininity and feminism and sexuality and obsession. Um, what is so exciting? I love that I described that book as a beast because now we have an animal. <laughs> and this book um, takes a lot of those same sort of themes that Lisa was tossing up in the air and she sort of pulls them all together and just turns them into this fireball. Um, and so I just wanted to um, acknowledge kind of a through line between the two books, but our conversation is gonna really focus on animals. So Lisa, I wondered if you wanted to start by reading or just wanted to begin with chatting. I like chatting. Okay. That's okay with you. <laughs> yeah, it's totally, totally fine. I had something I was going to ask you to read, but I oh, won't. I will, no, no. If you have something you want me to read, I will read it. I just. I, I was hoping you would read just the, just a little bit, the first uh, page of chapter two from, so that's in the galley, that's page seven to the word sociopath on the top of page eight. Are you able to find that? I could have told you this. Before. Got it. Okay. No, as long as someone has, if you ask me to do it, I will do it. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. If someone asked me to describe myself in a single word, depraved is the one I would use. The deprivation has been useful to me. Useful to what end, I couldn't say. But I have survived the worst. Survivor is the second word I've used. A dark death thing happened to me when I was a child. I will tell you all about it, but first I want to tell what happened, what followed the evening that changed the course of my life. I'll do it this way so that you may withhold your sympathy, or maybe you won't have any sympathy at all. That's fine with me. What's more important is dispelling several misconceptions about women, mostly. I don't want you to continue the cycle of hate. I've been called a whore. I've been judged not only by the things I've done unto others, but cruelly by the things that have happened to me. I envied the people who judged me, those who lived their lives in a neat, predictable manner. The right college, the right house, the right time to move to a bigger one. The prescribed number of children, which sometimes is two and other times is three. I would bet that most of those people had not been through 1% of what I had. But what made me lose my mind was when those people called me a sociopath. Some even said it like it was a positive. 
I am someone who believes she knows which people should be dead and which should be alive. I am a lot of things, but I am not a sociopath. Thanks for reading. Uh, so is she? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't think so. No, I, I think that, um, you know, what I was so interested in with animal and, and it's, it, this is one of the kernels that sort of um, kicked off the ideas for me. But do, do you know the um, the astronaut who found out her partner was cheating on her and drove across the country wearing a diaper, right? Uh, you know, with like stuff in the back to like kill either either him or 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 the the woman he was having the affair with. Um, and to me, you know, I think the first thing that people say when they hear that story is like, oh, my God, you know, like, what a psycho, right? Mm -hmm. And, like, you can say whatever you want about the morals of it, um, you know, <laughs> is it right? <laughs> no. But the idea of the woman wearing a diaper, you know, I found so, mm -hmm. um, so absolutely poignant because it's like, if you're that angry and that upset and that, you know, if something, if somebody has just turned your entire life upside down um you don't want to stop to pee you know and that doesn't make you crazy it just makes you have um propulsion and forward motion <laughs> it makes you um you know kind of uh efficacious i think so i was interested in that and to those ends i do not think that um that Joan is a sociopath. I think that's that there are a constellation of events that have happened that have that have sort of, you know, shown turned her into this galaxy that she's become, but each of them are very discernible points on a map. Yeah, I want to return to this problem of who's crazy and who's not, and whether or not craziness has caused or is something we're all just sucking in through the ambient yeah. air of what we have to live <laughs> in. But, um, I really loved opening with that, with that assertion that she's not a sociopath. I just thought that was a really nice, even masterful note of, a, you know, a doth protesting too much where we really, as a reader, we automatically are in this sort of uncomfortable position with the narrator. Yeah. Um, where we are definitely going to stay for the whole book. Um, <laughs> though I was, I found her strangely deeply sympathetic. Um, before we get back into the madness piece, um, I was wondering if you could just start by talking about the history of the book and, you know, did, the, did that image of the, of the astronaut, was that a kernel? Was that causal or was it just sort of something that illustrates something you were interested in exploring? It, it was more so the latter, something that illustrated something that I was interested in exploring. Because I can, I mean, I, I obviously will not be able to think of them now if asked, but there are so many moments in, in my life. And there is something that Joan says in the book too, where it's like, you know, whenever someone did something, does something terrible, people are like, but why, why would you do that? And Joan says she knows exactly why someone would do something. And, you know, it, it's funny because whenever my six-year-old daughter does something horrid, like, you know, loses my mother's wedding ring or something, I'll be like, why did you do that? And my husband's <laughs> like, why are you asking a six-year-old why she did that? And I'm like, uh, 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 <laughs> I don't know. Um, and so, and, and for, it's similar for me with, um, with, uh, with Joan, it's like, you know, she doesn't need to ask the question because there are these, you know, just much like with my six-year-old, she did it because she didn't know that it wasn't, that it was important. And because she has a six-year-old's brain and is not, you know, putting the, is not thinking about whatever. And the same thing is true of people who are in dire situations. I think Joan comes from a very haunting past and, um, and, and the things that happen to Joan, the things that happen to many of us when, when we're young are, are, you know, just really, they kind of ink what's going to happen in our future and how we're going to eventually one day maybe explode. And I was really interested in the, in the idea of, of memory with this book and, and the idea of how memory sits and eventually kind of like expands and, you know, just sort of soaks everything after a while, you don't even really notice it's doing it. Yeah, I think that that, um, I was really interested in how, uh, the book is, I'll just for people who haven't read the book, the book, book, this woman, she's clearly very damaged. She's on some kind of hellbent mission to do something, but we don't know what, do you think that's fair to 
I don't want to give anything away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's great. Um, and so the book is heavily plotted. Like there's a lot of plot in this book, which is really pleasurable for the reader, right? I mean, it's very, it's it's very, you use the word um, propulsion yourself. And there's a lot of propulsion to this book. That's a propulsive book. Um, and a lot of the um, plot is very uh, bloody or dramatic. I don't think I'm giving anything away. I think that's all implied at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask about, um, as a, you know, you're a writer who, one of the things I really love about your work, and I really loved it in Three Women, and I actually think it really carries through to this book, is the way that you are driven by ideas. You're really animated by certain ideas, but then in Three Women, and then again here, you sort of let stories take on a life of their own and kind of, um, the elements of the ideas get explored through story and through action. Mm -hmm. um, so in Three Women, you're not always big footing in to tell us what everything means. You're more arranging the material and standing back and letting people draw their own, which is own conclusions, which is clearly what good fiction does. But, but and this work is so heavily plotted. And so I was wondering if there's a way in which the intense dramatics of the book are almost meant as, are they almost like metaphorical? Like why, why, I, I have this question, you know, what made you decide to write a bloody book rather than, you know, a cheeverish depiction of quiet despair, right? right? Like why all the blood? Yeah, okay, so I, I think that, um, for me, one of the things that that animal uh, is a depiction of for me is is a sense of of grief and loneliness. Um, for me, you know, a lot of a, a lot of the reasons why I connected with people during Three Women and, and a lot of the reasons why people spoke to me at length and 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 deeply was because I was I had had a lot of loss and grief in my life, mm -hmm. and I think sometimes it is um, it is and at a fairly young age it. it when you are struck in those sorts of ways um, and then the, your contemporaries don't have the same experiences, it's kind of hard to communicate how bad something can be. So in a way, I didn't, I lost both my parents, not in the way that Joan quite wildly loses hers, but for me, it felt like, you know, I was being like mauled to death by a tiger and people were coming to see me and they were like, oh, we can just give her band-aids and stuff because it's just, you know, she lost her parents. I don't exactly know what that's like, but, you know, she'll be okay in a couple of weeks when really I was completely reshaped by those losses. So in Animal, the blood is kind of like, this is how... Joan feels do you know what I mean like sometimes you yeah. need to go to that sort of gothic area to describe what normal pain feels like what other what to other people looks like something that you could get over in a couple of weeks or months well and she talks about that dissociation from other people's pain and how difficult it is to understand another person's pain yeah. and in a way like the centrality of Joan's pain you know there's a way in which it implies all the other characters having that same anguish, but she can't see past her own. Yeah. Um, yeah. So did, did this, was this written, um, is this a book that you've been working on for a while or was it something that came out of Three Women or? I, um, I wrote it um, during my last year of researching Three Women. I had gone to, um, I was living in Boston talking to one of the, the, the women um, kind of finishing up the story, et cetera. Um, and I went to get my MFA um, in fiction at Boston University and Animal was like the first 80 pages or so were my thesis statement. So I wrote it at the tail end of sort of waiting for three women stuff to, to culminate. Gotcha. Because it's definitely one of the things that's really, um, it's a weirdly fun book, given the darkness of the book. <laughs> And one of, it is cultural critique. Like there's a lot of cultural critique here. There's a lot of, obviously, you know, this is a book about a feminist or a, a female rampage. So there's kind of a, there's a gender critique that's happening here that we'll continue to talk about. But there's also, it's a book that's set in New York and Los Angeles and deals a lot with 
class and consumption in both those places. And a lot of the cultural critique is very funny. Like the sort of um, the dumb, lovable young guy who says he's practicing practicing stoicism <laughs> in between mining Bitcoin. Um, that was so good. Um, so I, I was really curious about when it was written because it had this quality of having been worked on for a long time. Like it's a very finished, you know, you really explored every aspect of the character and there's a lot of plot, but then there's these things that are super of the moment. So I was sort of curious about the timeline. Yeah, I mean, it was it was pretty much, um, it was, I probably wrote it in 2018 and, and then, you know, did some editing obviously in the past, you know, year or so. And had you lived in LA when you wrote it or? I, I wasn't, um, I, I have lived, I had lived in LA, but not, I was writing this in Boston. So I, um, I had, but I had lived in Topanga Canyon where much of the book is that, that was one of the places I lived in LA. And it was, it was just such a, um, a wild sort of hellscape of a beautiful hellscape, but, um, but I was so enchanted with it and also scared of it. I mean, I don't, have you ever been to Topanga Canyon? To, yeah. you know the drives like the, the I mean I still I went there a couple of weeks ago to to do some um some some for some work trips and uh and I one of the things I did was do um this profile with the LA Times and the photographer and I went to the top of the canyon and I drove up those streets and the, there was a fire starting in Pacific Palisades right in that moment but we kind of got stuck up there sort of um and I was just like, I could not believe that I had driven home night after night, <laughs> whatever, up those like wild breakneck um, mountain turns. Have you read Golden Days by, sorry, have you read Golden Days by Carolyn C? No, I've never even heard of it. I'm going to write it down though. I'll send you a note. It's, uh, it's incredible. It was written, I think in the early 70s and it also is set in Topanga oh, and it's really? also a dystopian apocalyptic novel about a woman in her 30s or 40s. In this case she's kind of trying to navigate the sexual revolution but she's also hoarding gems because she oh, those are the only thing she's convinced that's going to see her through the apocalypse which in fact comes and it's sort of the great lost California novel. And it's kind of a, it's got some twinship with this book. Oh, wow. I can't wait. The only book that I had ever, and I haven't read that book, but the only one that I had, that I knew of, that I didn't read was The Tortilla Curtain by T.C. Boyle. I haven't read that one. I know that's set in Topanga, but I, I, when I like found Topanga, because I didn't know what Topanga was until I was in LA and living there. When I... <clears throat> found uh Topanga I was just like I can't believe this hasn't been written about you know like a million times it's yeah. just like there's so much that that happens yeah absolutely I think that um I was really interested in uh there's there's an aspect of the book where the character is sort of surrounded by sexual menace is one of the is the kind of feeling of the book. And she even sort of becomes surrounded by historical sexual menace in this really interesting way. There's sexual menace from, that had happened probably even before she was born in California that becomes a plot point in the book. And I was one, so there's like these, these kind of orgies that end up being a plot point. And I was curious if that was something that you had researched history on or you invented out of whole cloth or how much LA history informed this actual writing? Um, it was a real, Sandstone um, was a real place in Topanga Canyon that I had known about. Um, uh, and, and, and I drove past it, you know, this was when I was still, I was living there researching some people for three women in, in LA proper, mm -hmm. but um, I drove to Sandstone. I think that was before I had moved to Topanga to see like what it looked like and it was kind of you know boarded up sort of you couldn't really see the house in the background but it was a real place um but the stuff that happens in the book is is you know is is fictionalized but it, it, <laughs> it was a real place um the details from that were so good i mean there's just there's a way in which can i just give one detail away yeah sure like this thing about there's a there's a cow skin trampoline Am I right? Yeah. And women bounce on it naked and the men watch. And there's just something about that that is just so everything disgusting <laughs> about Southern California and the sexual revolution. Um, it's just a perfect detail. 
Um, <laughs> you, you capture so much. I mean, it does, the book is this kind of, you use the word hellscape and there is this way in which we're trapped in Joan's obsessive brain. Mm -hmm. And it's this hellscape of her trying to navigate the world, you know, despite everything that's happened to her and somehow desperately acting out of her own pain, but also in a weird way, trying to right wrongs. And so we're really, it's really um, locked into her point of view. But as I said earlier, there's a lot of cultural observation. And I think that, you know, so including that stuff about Topanga in the seventies and now, conversely, there's a lot of stuff about luxury and wealth. Mm -hmm. um, and Joan is really interesting because she's not just fluid in her class um, position, she's like liquid. She's moving around in class positionality all the time. Um, and I thought that you got really at this really interesting idea about luxury and sexuality being intertwined Mm -hmm. And how women's sexuality is collapsed with the exchange of luxury goods. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about how that came to be in the book? And Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was, it was important to me to have, um, it's for part of Joan, Joan wants, you know, like we all do, love and kind of safety, um, or maybe not safety exactly, but certainly to feel um, secure in being cared for in some way. But um, but I also wanted her to want a lot of things and to, at the same time, um, recognize the kind of ridiculousness that comes from wanting. And I'm also really interested, you know, I mean, I think there's always haves and haves not, have nots, right? Mm -hmm. I'm interested in the people who are have, um, have nots, but who understand all the haves. Yeah. You know? And I, I think that's an interesting context. And I think that what's re remarkable to me about um, about our country, you know, in so many countries, but certainly with ours and so many of the places I've, I've lived, you know, you, you have a, a beautiful enclave and then two miles down the road, you have, you know, like people really struggling to live. And I think that the, um, the, 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 the coming together of those two things within Joan herself, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the idea of uh, at various times in her life, having had the money to have beautiful things, and then at other times having, I mean, completely not, not knowing, you know, if she's going to be able to put gas in her car, that sort of um, living on that edge is so striking to me and interesting. And I think when it comes to women's beauty and sexuality, it's like, you know, there's, there, there were two kinds of beauty that, that Joan could aspire to be either like the sort of, you know, sexual, sensual, creature that doesn't require being dressed in any particular way but then she also knew that there was a um a a a, a value to being to being perfectly adorned on top of her sensuality that that would give her a mark of of elegance that might that might keep her out of some elements of sexual threat because usually women who are poorer are targeted so i think and, and because she had been targeted so much um, and groomed so much, she has a real understanding of that. And that's part of why she wants money and, and sort of, you know, that safety that comes from, 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 from fiscal uh, comfort because she feels like that protects her from some of the sexual threat as well. Yeah, that was sort of how I read it was that there's this really interesting high low which yeah. I've actually seen with people I've known who've been kind of marginal or like maybe drug abusers or something where there's some consumption of luxury goods and then some um, just total instability. Yeah. yeah. And, and yet somehow this inability to stay in the middle. And I thought the sort of dropping away of the middle class in Joan's life reflected the dropping away of safety, family, all these different, and the money stuff I thought was just absolutely brilliant. Um, it means a lot to me. Oh, well, sure. <laughs> um, I guess I was hoping, do you want to make a statement about women? <laughs> <laughs> make a blank statement? Well, yeah, I just think, um, I think what this book is, it's so interesting, is she's so enraged. And by the end of the book, you sort of come to feel really sympathetic to her rage. Mm -hmm. um, she, but she's not just a victim. She's a par participant in her own um, diminishment a yeah. lot of times. And you kind of get at that, at that problem of consent 
being yeah. so much closer to lack of consent than we like to really acknowledge. Mm -hmm. Even so, and I thought that was really nuanced and well done. And even so, we do start to really believe in her rage by the end. And I guess one question I had is, is and you talk a lot about how rape, in the book you talk about how rape happens all the time and that there's these little rapes that occur. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, when in the 80s when I was in college, we called that the rape spectrum. I don't know if they still use that phrase. Uh -huh. um, or the rape continuum, excuse me. Uh -huh. uh, so I guess it's really interesting to think about Joan's rage being traceable to a specific event. Mm -hmm. And it's like, is there a way in which that event is a stand-in for this like, me, you know, this sort of mire of rape that we're all in all the time? Yeah. Like, like um, what's the causality there from so, an office point of view? From, from from what I think is, I think that for Joan and for a lot of women, and certainly for myself, I think that the um, the sort of assaults, be they emotional or physical, that I have been um, that I have been complicit in, and by complicit I mean like you know just in in any way not pushing it off in any any even sustan of of like of allowing it those are the ones that feel the most horrific to me mm -hmm. because I, I, it has been, I have been part of it. I've been party to it. I have, I, my own, my own emotional weakness has allowed for, you know, physical or more emotional weakness. And I find that to be so interesting. And, and in Joan's, in Joan's situation, the, the things that she felt that she was um, complicit in or, or the things that she didn't put a stop to in a certain way affect her much, much harsher than than the ones that did that that she wasn't affected by uh, that that she was not um she was not complicit in that she allowed that she did not allow to happen but that just happened to her when she was either too young or too whatever. So I'm I'm very interested in that sort of um in the way that uh in the way that we you know I think. Uh, there's a line where Joan says there's these, or, you know, I think maybe Alice, the, the woman that becomes very important to her says it, that there's these rapes that we shower for, in a sense, you know, <laughs> that was a great it, line. obviously, I don't mean that that's a, you know, it, it, but at the same time, it, 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 you know, it's, it's, there's such a history of, of, of women um, that obviously just in the past couple of years has come to the service, but there's a long history of us just feeling like we need to go with the flow of certain things and, you know, be cool and be, and be permissible and be um, open and, 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 and understand the nature of other people. And I think that, um, that, that those things that we do to ourselves are the things that we punish other women for the most, because we don't like to see it. We don't like to see each other sort of being weak and we, we struggle to remember the times that we have felt weak ourselves and, and done the same thing ourselves. So I was very interested in kind of trying to crack that open as much as possible. Yeah, I think that there's a really amazing passage in the center of the book, kind of right in the middle where Alice starts to provide that um, pushback. Um, Alice, who's, who's the main character's friend and sort of another object of her obsession because she starts to push back against Joan's idea, not of her victimization, but just that, um, of just sort of her role in all these situations. In some cases, Alice is saying she has been victimized, you know, and in other cases, she just gets frustrated with Joan staying stuck in this dynamic that she's been in with men. And so you can see, even though Alice sees Joan as victimized, Alice has to bail because she can't tolerate it. Yeah, yeah. And that's, and that's something that I think is really, it's something I saw a lot after three women, you know, people saying that some of the, the women in the book were pathetic for, for, you know, for, and, and victims. And, and I think that, and I always bring up, you know, um, uh, Sex in the City and, and Carrie and Miranda's relationship in specific, you know, and Carrie like can't quit big. Right. You know? And Miranda's like, I'm done listening about him. And I always find that so striking because, um, you know, I've, 
I, I, I find it, I, I find it to be, there's nothing sort of colder and harder we can do to another person than say like, we're done listening to your obsession as though, you know, your upset, as though the other person's obsession is, it is like, if we really understood how hard other people were falling for things, you know, in those moments, we just don't, we, we, it's, it, it kind of, it, it makes us all, I think, feel more powerful to be like, oh, I don't have a problem with that. Oh, oh God. How, and, you know, and if we are able to stand in order to be up here, sometimes we need to stand on other people's shoulders. And that's something I think we do with female vulnerability and sexuality all the time to one another. And that's something I really wanted to look at with Alison Jones. Yeah, I agree. I was just going to use the phrase high horse, right? Like yeah. it's this idea of being exactly. up above. And I think that that's a real, what you're describing is this range of attitudes about complicity, about consent, you know, that we, that the, how we put ourselves in victimized situations that we're maybe consenting to, mm -hmm. but that there's this range of experiences that has that sort of reflects what we were talking about earlier, which is this idea of this range of violations. Um, there's Sarah Heppola has written about this really interesting in Blackout. If you've read that, it's her book about problem drinking. Um, about but, what? About drinking. It's about quitting drinking, but it's also, it's more than that. It's about blacking out. Um, and she talks about this notion of drinking to consent. Um, and it's something, it's, it falls into the category of what you're talking about. It's a subject matter we're uncomfortable with. Yeah. There's either consent or there's not consent. Right. So when you step into these waters of making the main character complicit in her own victimization, you really run the risk of um, having people hate your character. Yeah, it's Which, shocking, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I find it so shocking. That, and, and thank you. And you just said it so um, eloquently and, and really just, I mean, it just nails it. I, I, it's so shocking to me that people are like, oh, how could she have done that? And it's like, what are you, have you never done? I, I just don't believe you that you haven't done stuff. Like, you know, like I just don't, I always, I, I think that, you know, um, I just think that that the idea of, 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 of running that risk and I knew it was a risk, you know, and I, I understood it, but I also, at the same time that I understood it was a risk, it's like, for me, it was just so, it's such a real true thing that so many of us are, so many of us do, you know, I speak to so many people who like, you know, f repented um, former obsessives who are like, I don't know, you know, I, um, you know, I, maybe, you know, they're married now or they're whatever. And they're like, I don't know. I'd probably do the same thing all over again. If, cause there's something it's, there's an addictive um, quality to that. It's, it's, it's a love can be an addiction like, like any other and, and not just love it's, but all the things that are wrapped up with love, the idea of safety, the idea of feeling actualized and someone care, you know, like I'm a worthy person, like Maggie in my book felt loved and made actual and whole by, by her teacher. And, and it's not pathetic to get that feeling and to keep wanting it, you know, just like it's not pathetic to have, you know, a problem with alcohol or it's, it's just the idea of the word pathetic for people who, who we just, we each have our faults and flaws and addictions in all different places because we've been fucked up by our parents, you know, <laughs> and, and we're going to keep doing it to our, and it's just going to keep happening. The only thing we can do is to be as you know, as, as sort of um, open and generous to other people making mistakes as possible. Right, I mean, that's very, what that was very much my MO in writing my second memoir, Love and Trouble, was like yeah. this quality of obsession and like this problem around sexuality and being a sexual person and how does it inter interlock with one's own victimization. Um, those were all things that I really saw people feeling. They weren't even talking about them let alone writing about them, but I saw them feeling them. And um, I knew in writing about that, that I was going to be an un unlikable narrator. And I was, you know, I was excited to do that after having written one book with a very likable narrator. But it's interesting, because I remember talking with a group of women writers over a weekend a couple of years ago, like what, we don't get to have the anti-hero. We yeah. don't get to have the unlikable woman narrator who's cool. We don't get to have the asshole Don Draper. 
right? Yep. We get to have a woman who's struggling with her own victimization. And that's, you know, this is not a book about a girl boss who goes out and murders people. This is not <laughs> that book. It's a book about a person working through her own victimization. And I, I just don't know if, if you can create a female antihero who kind of doesn't encompass that. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I, I, you know, I mean, I, one of the books that I, that I, that is a huge influence for me is, um, is Natalia Ginsburg's The Dry Heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's so, it's, and, and also another one that I also, um, go back to all the time is Elena Ferrante's, uh, Lost Daughter. Mm -hmm. And there's another anti-hero because the woman leaves her kids kids her two daughters for two years or so and then sort of like like she leaves for her it's not really talked about too much why but um and then I have another friend another writer friend who who writes very you know books that everybody loves but the one book that she wrote that did the most the only book that didn't do well was a book she wrote about a quote-unquote bad mo a mother who it's always is, the mother always it's, it's that thing it's you know and and it's 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 that feeling of like we just do not want to, we're like no 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 we can't hear it we can't hear it um but men can go off and leave you know i like thinking about like um is it is it legends of the fall it's like brad pick goes off onto the bow and, and it's like you know he's just, just every like, rock musician it's ever. ever ever it's like you just they go off and they have to do these crazy things all by themselves and just and then they come back and then you have to, you know, even what's his name in The Wrestler, you know, it's that same thing. It's like, oh, well, he had to do it. We don't look, we just look at that guy and we're like, oh, I hope his daughter starts talking to him again. And right. I, like, I think oh. of Gogan, like Gogan got on a boat and flew yeah. and sailed to Tahiti yeah. and wrote a letter to his wife in which he said, in base, and said, I am a great artist. Yeah. Right. I, and that's the important part of the story is off he I, goes. Exactly. Um, yeah, you know, we were talking before we began here about, I'm working on this book about bad people who make great art or what do we do with the art of monstrous men, which is something that I've written on before, but I'm just finishing a book on this subject. And the question, you know, people kind of come up to you when they find out that's your subject matter and like, they're going to catch you out. They say, well, are you writing about any women? Yeah. Like you're going to be found out <laughs> being a feminist or something like what women are you writing about? And <laughs> It's fascinating because the only truly women who are really perceived as monstrous is child abandoners. It's like that is the female crime. If rape is the male crime, you know, it's just like exactly. child abandonment is the female crime. Exactly. Um, and abandonment, just even like, you know, I'm going to the spa today. It's like, oh, <laughs> oh, I mean, it's not quite, you know, it's just, it, it's, and I think it's something we've seen so much with the pandemic, you know, what, how, how women have done you know, yeah, have, it's, horrifying. it's just, it's really, it's just, it's, and we all knew it. I mean, it's not like it's like new information, but, and it's not everybody and it's not, you know, but it's, it's so many that, you know, um, there was this amazing article in time, uh, uh, that about women, you know, in the workforce and what happened with the pandemic. And it's just, it's just, there's so much, um, there's so much there. And I'm, but, I, but for me, it's that women do it so much to, other women it's that that is the real crime for me that I think is that that needs to be changed um I'm going to release you to your uh questioners in the audience but before I do that I do want to just ask you to talk I have this one question and it's very specific but um I just the nature of obsession. I think one of the reasons this book is so good is that you don't, it's just as we were talking about consent and victimization, your view of obsession is, is made complex or is complicated by the fact that one of the most damaging obsessions in the book is experienced by a man. Mm -hmm. um, so everybody in this character, in this book is just like going around obsessing about each other. And I was wondering if you could talk about, are there ways in which obsession can be gendered? Is there male obsession versus female obsession? Or did you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I think male obsession tends to feel, and I, I do, I don't like to generalize, but, you know, yes, of course, there's, the, you know, as, as gen, we do have things that separate us by gender occasionally. And I think that male obsession is, is generally more entitled. 
um, not even by the men themselves, but other people are like, oh, well, he wants, he, oh God, he really wanted her. Like women wanting is a much different, uglier thing. Men wanting, men raging for what they want. Men going after it is like them going with like spears into like battle and just taking what is theirs, you know? And then with women, you know, they go after what they want and it's like, oh my God, it's like an unsavory thing sometimes. I think with women, there's, um, there's an element to, you have enough, you know, you have a husband, a, a, two kids and that you have X, Y, Z, you know, you, you don't need any, what, what more do you want? There's still that. And, you know, it's okay that it's there because it's, we've been living in, in you know, with this sort of society of it for so long, but it's okay if it's there, but it's not okay to kind of keep like looking at it and, you know, keep kicking people down. So I, I find obsession, obviously, I mean, I think obsession is so, is so interesting to talk about, to write about, um, less so to feel. <laughs> but it's, so, to feel. It's, it's very, yes, it's, it's mind numbing to feel, but, <laughs> but, but after, you know, to write about it and talk about it, to think about it. I mean, whenever my friends, you know, my friends who are single, who, who have, um, new loves in their lives. I mean, that's the most exciting stuff to talk about. You know, it's it's more exciting than talking with your married friends about what each other's kids are doing. I mean, it's great. I you like I like to do it all, but I really like, I'm like, oh my God, and then what happened next? And that's how it was for me with three women. It was just this constant like being so right. intrigued, you know, by people's desires and and sex lives and the and the things that 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 made them crazy. Um, but yeah, but, but one of the prime obsessions in, in animal is a man's obsession for, for Joan and, and sort of the way that it make the way that it makes Joan, which I don't think men do as often, Joan felt like she had to nurture it and keep it in a safe spot. Mm -hmm. And I think that when a woman is obsessed with a man and he is not interested, he doesn't nurture it. He kind of just lets it grow like a weed and make like, it's, it's a different thing. And so, and that's why women, I think, have this feeling of complicity sometimes. And it's just kind of this, we have this caretaking, more nurturing biological vibe. So if someone loves us, we're not going to be like, you know, not text them back for, for right, right, right. several months. I, yeah. I, there was a real humanity or humanism in the way that you got at how both are all the obsession in the book is about the void and about what the character lacks. It's about the lack. And mm -hmm. um, there, there was a real empathy in that, I thought, um, that you found that core or that void um, in all the characters. Like, of course, that's the part I like, but that um, <laughs> you, you allowed every person their own howling void. And, and that, you know, that's generous when the men, you know, to, to do that to characters who aren't automatically likable. Yeah. So I really loved that. Thank you. All right, should we bring Patty in? Because I want to leave time for audience q and I don't know. Hi, Patty. It worked. <laughs> oh, wow, this could go on. It's so, this is so wonderful. Really, really wonderful conversation. We do have some questions. Um, I One of my questions, actually, because I've done a little research before you got on tonight. So you've You've done nonfiction, you've done fiction now. How about a memoir? It does sound like I've read a little bit about your past and the loss that you have. Is some of the book a little autobiographical? Is it not? Um, I mean, the loss. And, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't know. Well, I just, is a memoir in your future? Yeah. Um, I, a lot, you know, memoirs, I, I don't know if memoir is probably the right word, but the, I, um, I'm going to, I'm working on a book about grief, um, not just my own, but it'll be reported about other people. It'll be somewhat like, you know, three women in the sense that I will be talking to people hopefully in as, um, in as great depth, but also relating my own, my own, um, my own loss as well. Okay. And now that we're on the topic of three women, we did speak a little bit before we started tonight, um, what's happening with three women? Is it going to be a film? Is it going to stream? It Where... is going to be a series on Showtime. Okay. Um, and we are currently talking to uh, cast and, and directors as we, not, uh, not exactly as we speak, but right after we speak. 
and <laughs> prior. Um, so, so we're in the, the fun sort of stage. We've written, we've written 10 episodes and we are hoping to shoot it in the fall. Wow. Oh, yeah, and you're involved in the writing. How's that going? Good, good. I mean, it's done. It's, it's done. It's so good that it's done. I know, I know. I know, now that it's done, I'm like, oh, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> do you feel like you were true to your voice that's true to the book do you I had um you know I had a really great team also I had um Laura Easton as the showrunner she was she's a very amazing playwright and also um worked in tv on uh House of Cards and the loudest voice in in the room and and many other things and and she's been great and there were two other um writers as well and my husband uh and so we had a small little group um, but it was really great, and and we just kind of all brought something to the table. Kind of all brought something to the table. Right. Okay. Um, there was a question that popped up. Um, you recently talked about women not supporting other women. I've been a victor victim of this behavior twice. Once years ago, as a breastfeeding mother, and just recently in the workplace. What advice can you give to other women on how we should eliminate this behavior? Oh God, I mean, uh, you know, I, I think that I, I, I think that the more we um, listen to one another and the more we sort of, I think the biggest thing is excavating why you would be unkind to someone specifically, you know, someone who's trying to legitimately just feed a human being. I mean, that sounds horrid. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I, I often think um, the times in my life when I've been angry or the times in my life that I've seen other people be angry, you often, if, if you just try to get, or, or someone just being rude, if you try to look at what, um, what perhaps where the person is coming from in that moment, I always find it so... Uh, so I think it's one of the most beautiful um, lines in, in celebrity media um, responses. And, and from several years ago, I think Perez Hilton um, was like making fun of Jennifer Aniston and some, sometime after the breakup and when he was with uh, Angelina Jolie. And she said she saw him in like a parking lot in Hollywood or something. And she was like, hey, I'm just wondering, why do you have to be so mean? And he said that the, the question just like stopped him in his tracks. And he was like, and it kind of changed every, everything about the way that he covered celebrity culture. And I find that so, um, so beautiful. The idea of like, just asking someone, what, what are you angry at? Like, or, is it really me? Like, is my breastfeeding really pissing you off? Or is there something else? You know, what, why are you being mean? I think is a really good question. Wow. It is indeed. Um, and to switch gears a little bit, I know that everybody watching tonight is wondering, both Claire and Lisa, what are you reading? What do you recommend? Um, there's a question from the audience, uh, other books about women rage, if you have other thoughts on that. Um, it's just a great topic. I think a lot of people don't want to talk about it, but I think after reading your book, certainly I'm a little more hungry for it. <laughs> um, so... I, on both those, what you're reading sort of for fun, what your nonfiction and fiction. And I did read, Lisa, recently that while you were writing your fiction, you were much more interested or really stuck to nonfiction while you were writing fiction. Could you speak to a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I find it that it's really, um, I, 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 I kind of have um, ADD when it comes to, um, I have a lot of, I have OCD, I have lots of something Ds, but when it <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to um to to reading uh I, I I like to read a lot of different things at once and when I'm writing I like to take in almost like the antithesis of the kind of thing I'm writing so I would like to read poetry while writing nonfiction to sort of remind myself that the nonfiction doesn't have to be um you know it doesn't have to be just the facts it can be the facts plus more than the facts uh, so that's that's what. But in terms of what I am reading, I was I'm very grateful to have a stack here of of things, so I can I can show you this. Good. This is um God I feel modern tonight by Catherine Cohen. It's like some modern poetry that I think is really just it. She's fantastic. She's funny and cool and um, 
Martin Amos Inside Story. I just got this. I'm really excited about it. I love Martin Amos. Um, Liberty, Caitlin Greenidge. This, uh, I was a judge on the, for the British Book Awards, and this is what we selected as the winner, Diary of a Young Naturalist. It was written, I think he was 15 when he wrote it. This, wow. this man, Dara McNulty, it's absolutely fantastic. I cannot believe, you won't believe it was written by someone under the age of 40. It's amazing. And then, sorry, there's, a, there's, there's more, more. I just really, no, this is great. It's great. And so we should guru Clara. Oh, Obviously, that's, you know, no surprise. Oh, Kevin Barry is one of the best writers, I think, ever. Um, I haven't started this yet, but I, I love his, um, his, his short stories are, are yeah. among my favorite. Um, oh, Patricia Lockwood, no one is talking about this. I've only read a little bit of it, but it's got some lines that just blew me away. And um, George Saunders is Women, the Pond in the Rain, which I'm half, like, I'm, I'm, I'm really- this pile, man. What? What? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I never have the answer. Usually I'm not in my, like my office meet, we're like sort of like read, like, you know, reorganizing the house. So I usually don't have my books around me. And I'm usually like, oh my God, what am I reading? What am I reading? <laughs> and this time I was just like, oh, I got it guys. I can go through everything right now. Lisa, can you show us the book since it came out yesterday, the cover? Just oh, you have sure. a copy or both, Claire, both of you. So you can... Just remind I all the people. I just have a galley that's been beaten up, gone in the bathroom. Okay. That's okay. You can that's see fun. it's a good book by how destroyed it is. <laughs> just so want much. to remind everyone that you get, if you buy a book um, tonight, or if you're watching our video later on YouTube, you can get a book plate. Um, and Claire, I want to know what you're reading too. Oh. Um, and is your book, gonna, when do you imagine we're going to be yeah, virtually or in person? I am finishing revisions on my book right now. So it's oh, not going to be anytime soon, but fortunately people keep being terrible. So it's going to keep being, <laughs> I don't think we're going to run. It, there is this, every time a story comes out, there is this feeling of like, oh my God, I should have it out right now. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it'll be fine. I just read, I, I thought, I realized I have a staff. Uh -huh. uh, I just reviewed both of these uh, for The Atlantic and they were both amazing. Oh, wow, yeah. Whereabouts yeah. by Jhumpa Lahiri. Wait, that's this one. And Second Place, which is the latest Rachel Cusk, which is incredible. If you've been reading the Outline Trilogy, this yeah. book sort of has some of that same voice, but it combines it with some of the more um, aberrant qualities of her earlier fiction and both are about um they're not about rage but they're about women sort of refusing to conform mm -hmm. uh and it, the both books really powerfully evoke this quality of refusal and i did think of another book about rage is the woman oh, upstairs by claire oh, yeah. oh i love that book right? yeah that's sort of the er rage text yeah um, you know it's it's uh yeah and then the other thing I've been reading a lot of is Barbara Pym, um, which is interesting to read in the context of rage. I've never, yes. amazingly, given how much I love mid-century British writing, I've never read her. And mm -hmm. her characters are these very genteel women, but they're constantly, they just, you know, they're just like vicars, secretaries or whatever. But they have, <laughs> all the book's dramas are about their boundaries, which is actually kind of about rage. So I'm, I'm loving them. I'm just powering through them. So that's what I'm reading. That's really cool. Well, this is, this is all terrific. We're coming to a close. Please, I I, I think I read Animal in one day. I mean, I just kind of read We're, it. It's, no, it, yeah. it's, it sort of elicits all, you don't, you, it's like looking at an accident. You want to look away, but you want to read it. I mean, and it's, <laughs> and it is so plot driven and it is so fantastic. So please, um, buy the book, especially from an independent bookstore, RJ's or any independent bookstore. And Lisa, we're thrilled. I hope the next time you write a book and Claire, maybe you'll come East um, and visit us at RJ's. <laughs> it was a pleasure ha having a conversation with you women. Oh congratulations, Lisa. It's thank terrific. you. And thank you for the phenomenal. Thank you so much for those amazing questions. And thank you for having us um, at RJ. It's one of my favorite yeah in the country. Thank you so much. Come visit. All right. Good night, everyone. All right, bye. bye.